Welcome to Texas History Lessons. I'm Michael, and today we're going to be taking a look at the Tonkawa Nation of Central Texas. Now, if you'll pull up your mental map of Texas and try to imagine Waco to the north on I-35, Austin to the south on I-35, to the northwest of Austin between Waco and College Station, where Texas A&M is, there's a county called Milam County. County seats Cameron. If you ever in there, stop by. They have some really good barbecue places in there. Now, the highest point in Milam County is known as Sugarloaf Mountain. Now, in Texas, we have a tendency to give names like mountain to high points, but there's no way that anybody from anywhere else that actually has seen a real mountain would say that's a mountain but it's sugarloaf mountain and most people probably don't even know where it is it's 13 miles southeast of cameron near the little river where the little river flows into the brazos river so yeah it's not a real mountain in any traditional sense of the word but it's the highest point in milam county and it is now in private property so you can't actually visit it uh, I guess unless you get permission from the owners, and I guess you could do that if you wanted to. Um, but there is a historical marker near there. And why it's significant is, back in 1994, the president of the Tonkawa Indian tribe of Oklahoma came down to Milam County. Her name was Virginia Combrink, and she identified Sugarloaf Mountain as the legendary La Tortuga, the tortoise the Tonkawa's mythological birthplace. They believe that Sugarloaf Mountain is a spot where, according to the Tonkawa creation myth, a wolf turned a tortoise on its back and then covered a deep hole into the earth. And from this hole in the earth came the Tonkawa people. And the tortoise, La Tortuga, was transformed into the sacred red mountain. And for this reason, from this story, the Tonkawas say they lived underground until the great wolf came, uncovered them, and this became part of their belief system where they had great reverence for the wolf. Um, Hunter-gatherers such as Comanches, Kiowas, Coaticans, Tonkawas, and Karakwas since their lives depended on hunting, tended to have deities and ceremonies revolve around animals, such as the wolf. And so the Tonkawas venerated the great wolf. David LaVere, in his History of Texas Indians, says this hunting religion is the world's first religion and dates back to Paleo-Indian days. And they also had a taboo on killing wolves, and sometimes this was even extended to the coyote. Now... The state archaeologist at the time says, well, I don't really know if this really can be proven factually. We don't really know if this, this is kind of a weak case that Sugar Mountain is. I mean, the guy forgot the part where it's a creation myth. Now, he traces the Tonkawa creation to a place right downstream from Sugarloaf Mountain at the confluence of Little River and the Brazos. And there was, in the 1700s, a major village, city, known as Rancheria Grande de los Herbapiames. Uh, a Spanish explorer, Diego Ramon, had visited there in 1716 and said there were about 2,000 people living there. And this was a conglomeration of about 22 nations that gathered together to protect each other from Spanish and Apache aggression. Now, the Irva Piames apparently would have been more likely to be considered Koa Takon, but the Tonkawas themselves are a unique case in Texas history. Now, if you'll remember... We've been looking at the Coaticans, the Humanos, and the Karankawas so far. And all of these peoples were gathered together as culturally similar 
and had different names for each band. They did have some relations. And we, as historians and anthropologists, have given them the name of Humano and Coatecon and, and Karankawa to refer to all of them as a whole. The Tonkawas, however, are some very disparate groups that came from north, south, east, and west, came together and created their own nations and created their own identity as the Tonkawas. It wasn't something forced on them. This is something, um, as one person wrote, it's an ethnogenesis, something that happened that they did themselves. And it's a very, very interesting story about them. Um, so what we had were all these different bands, multitude, very smaller, almost autonomous bands. Uh, and they came together at some point and we're going to get into when and forged themselves into a single people. Uh, to again, quote David LaVere and from his book, Texas Indians, the Tonkawas of central Texas, as we think of them today, were some of the most complex and fascinating of all the Indian peoples of Texas. Ethnogenesis took place constantly in Texas as Indian peoples made and remade themselves. Bands split, rejoined, were absorbed by other cultures, or were pulled into Spanish missions where they created kinship with other groups. Rather than a single racially pure Indian nation, the Tonkawas were a composite people who created themselves from the many Indian bands roaming central Texas. Now, the band that get the Tonkawa name comes from uh, that is, uh, they call themselves the Tikkun Watik, and the Tonkawa is actually a Waco word, and we'll get into that in just a second. Um, they had a very similar lifestyle. They were a plains culture. We've we've talked about how there was the like the woodland uh, cultures to the east. There were the coastal Indians, and then there was a Western Pueblo influence, like the Humanos. These were people that grew up hunting largely on the prairies and plains. So they had that nomadic hunter-gatherer culture that had been developing there for centuries and centuries. And they had a similar lifestyle to the Lapan Apaches, but for much of their history, they were actually enemies until the very end, we'll see. Uh, Tonkawa is a Waco term, meaning they all stay together. And as I said, they call them Tikkun Watik, the most human of people. Uh, in the late 17th century, Spanish missionaries among the Caddo's mentioned that some of the, the Caddo's Western enemies included the Apaches, but also the Tonka Kwe, Tonkawas, and the Yuhane, or Diwans, who were actually apparently living in some kind of uh, friendship with the Tonkawas. But they were actually closer related to being the Wichita's, who we'll learn more about. They were more of an agricultural people than a nomadic. But they had, I guess, shifted and were being moving down with the Tonkawas from this place where they were living. And then at the same time, just east of the Guadalupe River, there was a large gathering of Indians who were friends of the Caddo's. And these were the ones that all these different many different nations of small independent bands that were living together and already forming relationships. And they had a common need to protect themselves against the Apaches. Now, over time, the Tonkawas and the Yuhanes moved down and found themselves living with these different bands. And this is where the ethnogenesis begins. Now, the Tonkawas were buffalo hunters. They lived in teepees. They had dogs to transport their property and hides. Now, when we get into it, there there were lots and lots of different bands, over 20. There was the Tonkawa proper. There were the Mayayay, the Yohanes, which actually a Wichita tribe that got absorbed into the Tonkawas in the second half of the 18th century. The Erva Piame of the Ranchero Grande, and there are lots of little small groups, Cavas, Emmet, Sana, Toho, Tohaha, Awash, Choyopan, Awal, the Achutni, Quesh, Nilhalai, Ninchopin, Pakani, Pakalata, 
Sanuk, Tal Pehueyu, the Cantonas, Kazekas, Menanguem, Sana Temu, and Zorquan. And I'm sorry if I said any of that wrong. Those are that's quite a mouthful, but those are some of the names of the bands that were living in Central Texas, from West Texas, South Central Texas, and Western Oklahoma to Eastern New Mexico. They all kind of came together in Central Texas and ended up becoming the Tonkawas. Now, these many bands of the Central Texas Prairies and Southern Plains, after decades of pressures and destruction from the Apaches and later the Comanches and the Wichitas, they did something remarkable. They joined together to create a nation, the Tonkawa Nation. And as I said before, historians have grouped different various bands into different groups like the Manos and Coatecons. And what I find remarkable about the Tonkawas is that they created their own identity and culture in Texas, much like Texans did from diverse parts of the world when they came into Texas in the 1820s and forged the Texas nation and identity out of not much more than just sheer will and a desire to make an identity, make Texas something different. And for the most part, they led a nomadic existence and lived in rather simple makeshift shelters, almost always of a temporary nature. They had teepees, which were generally small and constructed of poles covered with bison hides. They also lived in brush shelters, small temporary dwellings, which were abandoned whenever the Indians moved to camp. First, a framework of poles and light branches would be set up to form a cone over this was laid smaller branches, bark, brushwood, or mesquite, and occasionally this structure was thatched with grass and covered over with a few bison hides. The only mention of internal arrangement was that a fire was laid in the center, and apparently the their lodges were five to seven feet high, flat on top, and open on one or two sides. They also had brush shelters for certain ceremonial purposes. They they would build large dance lodges and other lodges for different um, ceremonies. For weapons, they made bows and arrows to hunt buffalo and deer and to fight with. The bow string was generally fashioned from bison sinew, and they also fought and hunted with spears and lances. Harnesses and lassos could be made from bison hides. Rope could also be made from the tails and manes of horses. They also used the inner bark of the mulberry tree to fashion ropes and coarse cloth, as well as a rope. Like other plains cultures, the bison was central to their survival, but they also supplemented this with deer. Everything on the animals would be used to provide food, clothing, housing, and tools. They also traded bison meat and hides. They would cook the meat by roasting, and some would be set aside to be cured to last longer. They'd take the dried venison or bison meat and pound it and mix it with pecan meal to form pemmican, a food source that they could be saved and was quite handy to travel with. And like other peoples we've already covered, the Tonkwas gathered and supplemented their diet by gathering herbs, edible roots, pecans, acorns, and wild fruits and whatever they could to survive. Agriculture did not have very large part in Tonkawa life because according to Tonkawa tradition, the wolves had instructed them not to plant crops or build permanent dwellings. Some bands, like the ones that had been related to the Wichita at one point up in the north, might have grown some corn, but for the most part, they tried to follow the way of the wolf. Stay moving, stay hunting. So, what you have in about the 1600s, before European settlement is established at all, really, in Texas, Texas was full, Central Texas was full of all these different Indian bands. And that year, in 1684, 57 different Indian nations gathered for a trade fair on the upper Colorado River. This would have been one of the trade fairs that the Humanos would have gone to 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 supply and do business. Now, many of these different nations, 57 nations, would have eventually be absorbed by the Apaches, the Wichitas, the Caddos, and the Comanches later on when the Comanches finally did arrive in Texas. They're still not here in the 1680s. Um, that's going to be the 1700s before the Comanches even get close. Others went into Spanish missions or as workers on ranches. Others desi- died 
and disappeared from disease, warfare, and famine. But a good chunk of these 57 different nations that were there are what formed the basis of the Tonkawa people. To again quote David Laver in his from his excellent book, The Texas Indians. This was nation building at its most basic, fueled by the shattering of nations due to disease and warfare, and assisted by the tendency of Europeans and Americans to lump different people under one name, such as Tonkawa. It appears that the Tonkawa proper and the Yohannes, the second being closely related to the Wichita, as I've said, had come from the north, while other groups like the Mayayes came from the south and might have actually been related to a coastal group named the Atacapas. We've already talked about also the Erviames, and they might have been a composite of peoples who had run away from the missions to the south already to create their own nation. Uh, and many of these people would have been related to the Coatecans, where we'll see that the Caroncoas ended up being absorbed into many of them and became absorbed into the Tonkawa nation. Basically, it became a haven for anybody that was losing their home or, or in distress. The Tonkawas pretty much would take them in, is what it appears to be. Smallpox epidemics had severe impacts on some of the humano trade we learned about in previous lessons, and a fear of disease apparently slowed their trade for several years. In 1709, the only groups to show up at the Colorado trade fairs were a few of the Huanes and some refugee, in, refugee Indians. And eventually, the Yohannes and the other refugees migrated to the Brazos River. And by 1715, Texas was already a dangerous place with raiding parties replacing trading parties as the Apaches became more and more active. And so these different bands started to congregate near the confluence of the Little River and the Brazos River. And this is when the Urvipayames created Rancheria Grande sometime after 1700. It became a huge gathering of native peoples. Just northwest, like I said, of General Area uh, Bryan College Station in Milam County. I'm not certain that the actual location has been discovered, but we know the general vicinity of where it's supposed to have been. Rancheria Grande became an important trade center where Hermanos from the west could meet cattle from the north. Why Tonkawa became the name instead of Erve Piame is unclear, except for when you consider that the Waco word means they all stay together. And then you think about it is somewhat appropriate for that name to be used when you recall the very diverse nature of these peoples that came together to create the Tonkawa nation and create the Tonkawa identity, they all stay together. These different peoples, they're staying together. Hence, Tonkawa became what they were known as. There are at least 2,000 inhabitants at Rancheria Grande. The converging cultures on the plains of and prairies of Central Texas formed close relationships and over time as they came together and started coalescing they began to create a ta true Tonkawa nation an identity that they were establishing Tonkawa culture began to evolve and clans developed with such names as bear, wolf, buffalo, snake mouth open, acorn, blinking eyelids other clan names included the real Tonkaways Maye and Sanu. A clan was led by a chief and the clans were matrilineal, meaning children belong to the mother's clan, not the father's. Tonkawa religion and a host of ceremonies developed that incorporated both the hunter-gatherer and farming beliefs of its disparate bands. They held deer and buffalo dances, wild hog dances, and the wolf dance was the national dance of the Tonkawas. Blavere wrote, The great wolf had told them to live always on the move, hunting, killing, and stealing, to never settle down or they would die. The wolf dance was a sacred, somber dance. 
Now, when somebody died, they had a lot of ritual that they followed. The deceased person's hair would be cut. Their face would be painted yellow. They would be wrapped in buffalo skins or blankets and placed in a grave with personal property. That could include guns, saddles, enemy scalps that had been taken, beads, and ashes from the man's pipe would be shaken out and hidden. Now, some talk with bands such as those at Ranchera Grande might have stayed in the area longer and made periodic buffalo hunting trips to the plains, while others stayed on the move, living in their small conical brush or hide-covered huts. They also, like we've seen almost pretty much every Texas nation in the past did, they tattooed and painted themselves. They wore necklaces and the earrings of bone and shell, and the men wore breech cloths made of hide, and women would wear deer skin skirts and supplemented by buffalo robes in the winter. I need to take a quick break to thank Age of Radio for hosting the show. And now we're back. And here we go. Once again, this is coming up. Cannibalism. Now, this is where things get a little interesting with the Tonkawas. As we've talked about for some of the other tribes, Karankawas, uh, Kowatekons, there was rumors of cannibalism, but really not much ever formed a basis for it other than it was maybe part of some ritualized practice. So the Tonkawas, like the Karankawas in Atacapas, gained a reputation as cannibals. Most Texas Indian peoples utilize a ritual of cannibalism at some point in their history. But by the 19th century, not so much. It was not looked on as a good thing anymore. Uh, The reasons for eating a part of the body of an enemy included revenge to gain his power or to deny him his body and uh, a whole body in the afterlife. Anthropologist Kelly Himmel wrote that during the 18th century, the Spanish never mentioned Tonkawa cannibalism and the French only once but overwhelmingly evidence of Tonkawa cannibalism exists for the 19th century. Frenchman La Harp wrote that he encountered the Tonkawa on his journey along the Red River in 1719. He reported that the Tonkawa and Apache were so hostile toward each other that they ate each other, not sparing even the women nor the children. La Harp also did add, though, that the Tonkawa are renowned above the others. Throughout the 1700s, the Apaches continued to be a threat to the Tonkawas. And then between 1746 and 1749, Spanish established three missions that we're going to look at in just a second. Though many Tonkawas had already experienced and left mission life in the South, The increased dangers posed by the Apaches made the people of Rancheria Grande realize they needed help. And four chiefs from Rancheria Grande visited San Antonio in June of 1745 and asked for a mission to be built among them. Now, one of the reasons would, yeah, they thought the mission coming, that maybe soldiers would come and help protect them against the raids, and the missions would provide merchandise and food. Well, it didn't really work out that well for them. So the Spanish, though, they're like, oh, okay, they're asking us to come. Spanish already worried about Apache raids themselves in San Antonio area, and they were concerned about possible French expansion into East Texas, and where French traders were very active in Texas, supplying guns, flags, goods to almost every Caddo, Tonkawa, Bidet, Atacapa village. With all of this in mind, the Spanish authorities launched a third round of missions in Presidio building and between 1749 and 1762, Spain built more than a dozen missions and presidios in Texas. 1746, they built Mission San Francisco Xavier de Horcasitas. 1749, they built San Ildefonso. Also in 1749, one that we've mentioned before, Nuestra Señora de la Candelaria. And presidios San Francisco Xavier. 1751. And they were built these on the San Gabriel River to serve the Tonquas of Rancheria Grande as well as any 
Atticusas, Bidays, Dead Hoses, Caronquas, who could be convinced to come visit and settle there. The reality of the missions, though, didn't really provide very many benefits for the Tonquas or their allies. The first year that some showed up, they said there wasn't enough food to give them. Um, the missions never really seemed to work out as the Spanish or the Indians hoped they would. Uh, the missions caused an increase in the periodic epidemics that swept through the missions' Indian populations. And the missions, instead of providing protection, they actually attracted Apaches, which made the Tonquas more willing to abandon the San Gabriel River missions. The San Xavier mission was raided by Apaches four times in its first year. So, 1756, Spanish abandoned the missions in favor of the ill-fated Santa Cruz de San Saba mission that they were going to establish for the Apaches. In retaliation, Tonka was joined with other Norteño tribes like Comanches, Wichita's, and others and devastated the San Saba mission in 1758. That's going to be an interesting story we'll get to sometime in the future. And following the Tonko participation in the destruction of San Saba, the Spanish regarded them as enemies until they established cordial relations again in the 1770s. Uh, by the late 1780s, the Tonkos actually were at a time of brief peace with the Apaches, and they were still in the process of nation building. And then a great epidemic hit in 1777, 1778, that further blurred the distinction between the groups that were coming together to become the Tonkawa nation. As time advanced, they continued their lives in central Texas. And then when Spain began to allow Anglo-American settlement, the Tonkawa saw it as a new opportunity to fight allies against the tribes that threatened them and the Tonquas began to aid the new Anglo allies against the Comanches. In the 1700s and to the early 1800s, the Comanches replaced Apaches as the main threat on the plains. And the Tonquas became allies with their once hated Apache former enemies because the Comanches were so powerful that they pushed the Apaches out of that role until where they were on the run from them. The Tonquas entered a treaty in 1824 with Stephen F. Austin to protect Anglo-American immigrants against the Comanche. Tonquas helped uh, fight at the Battle of Plum Creek in 1840 and again in 1858 at the Battle of Little Robe Creek. They fought side by side with Texas Rangers against Comanches. And the Tonka was also viewed not only as allies for fighting their battles, they also looked at the Texans as sources of goods and merchandise. The Tonka was and the Apaches made peace with the Texans, continued the war against the Norteños, and rode with the Texas Rangers, and later with the U.S. Cavalry as scouts and auxiliaries. The Tonka was served as a barrier between the Norteños and when I say Norteños, it's the tribes of the north, the peoples of the north, that would fight together often, Comanches, Wichita's, and others, Kiowa. So Tonka was served as this barrier between them and the Texas settlements. And despite their service to Texas, even providing food and horses for Austin's colony, Tonkawas came in for a large share of abuse by Texans. Outlaws would steal their horses, Bands of settlers often would accuse the Tonkawas of rustling and thievery and just gun them down. With no recognized rights, Tonkawas were, as one person wrote it, more often the victim of violence by Texans than the other way around. As Lavera said, misunderstandings and quarrels escalated into killings, and some Anglos killed Tonkawas merely for sport. The charge of cannibalism against the Tonkawas only added to their problem. Of all the tribes that had once practiced some form of ritual cannibalism, only the Tonkawas retained the practice, with many Comanches and Wichita's as their victims. 
It is still debated to this day whether this was merely ritual cannibalism or at times was even out of an actual need for food during hard times. Taco cannibalism turned powerful people against them. Texans and civilized Indians view the Tonquas with disgust. Comanches and Wichita's were horrified by Tonquas eating up their people, and they gave them no quarter. They were ruthless in fighting the Tonquas when it came to battle. There would be no mercy. So even as they served as scouts and auxiliaries for the Anglos, their population continued to dwindle. And, you know, you can visit the uh, Tonkawa Nation's website, and they even include the, the cannibalism in, in their own history of their people. It's not something they even deny that it's something that existed. Um, part of one of the rituals where they'd get back from a battle, they'd take the, the hands and feet of people and tie them to ropes and, and part of their dance and have those as part of their rituals. Uh, again, to quote anthropologist Kelly Himmel, she wrote, For the Karankawas and the Tonkawas, the period from the time of the Anglos coming until the 1860s was a particularly devastating time. Both were thriving ethnic communities with a long history in Texas and the Southern Plains at the beginning of this period. But by 1859, the Karankawas had been driven to near extinction on the banks of the Rio Grande River. And we're going to see the remnant of the Tonkawas that were left had been removed altogether from Texas, along with most every tribe across the Red River into Indian Territory. Now, for a brief period in the 1850s, Texas did have two reservations established on the Brazos River in Young County. And this included the Tonkawas, but it was dangerous for the tribes that were put there because they became targets for white raging attacks. If non-reservation Indians or just outright thieves stole horses or cattle from people, well, who's the obvious target? It's easy to go and attack the people on the reservations. Even if they were guilty or not, they would become the target. And so, out of fear of the, his people that were in his care, in summer of 1859, Indian agent Robert Neighbors led the Indians of both reservations and led them north across the Red River to Indian Territory. The Tonkawas consider this their own trail of tears. The Caddo's, the Wichita's, Tonkawas, Penateca, Comanches, all Indians who had once called Texas home for hundreds and thousands and thousands of years were driven from the state for their own safety. Now, this next part is where I first learned about the Tonkawas as a child. And that's one of the things that stuck with me when doing this lesson People just, in my recollection of the history, is like they just weren't liked by anybody. Other Indians didn't, uh, tribes did not like them, and they were disliked and spoken with disrespect by, by the Anglo's. Well, of course, the Anglo's talk with disrespect about most Native peoples. Um, that was part of their methodology of get, trying to figure out how to get them out of the state so they could have all the land for themselves. As a kid, my parents took me up to Anadarko, Oklahoma. And there was an awesome place called Indian City, USA, in which they had, sadly, it's closed at the moment. I'm hoping someday they'll open it back up. I think the Kiowa Nation owns it now. I don't know if they have plans to open it back up. Basically, it was a museum. There would be Indian dances there. They had a nice little gift shop. And you could walk through and see the different kinds of houses that different Native American peoples lived in. They had actual life-size houses built that you could visit, and that was really fun. But at the side of Indian City, USA, was a historical marker talking about the Tonkawa Massacre. And that's where I learned about them first. So what happened was they were moved up into the Wichita Agency, the Wichita's had been enemies of the Tonkawas for a long time. 
as they had also been enemies of the Comanches, and the Delawares didn't like them that much, or in the Shawnees, the Indian tribes that had moved into Texas from the east, like the Cherokee, Choctaw, Delaware, Shawnee, they were especially unnerved by the, the cannibalism that the Tonka was continued. So, on um, October 23rd, 1862, a large band of Indians attacked the Confederate allied Wichita agency. They burned down the agency headquarters, killed some Confederate officials, but mostly their rage was carried out against the Tonkawas. Their chief, Placido, and about a hundred of the Tonkawa people were murdered in this massacre. Now, it's unclear what really instigated it. Some say it was an attack by pro-Confederate Wichita's, Comanche, Shawnees, and Delawares on the pro-Union Tonkawas. The Wichita's and Comanches say, no, the Shawnees and Delawares are really the ones that doing it because they, they were taking revenge for Tonkawa cannibalism. Others said it was a Union attack on the Wichita Reservation, and the Tonkawas just happened to be in the way. We don't really know. But we do know that it happened, and it was another severe blow to an already dwindling population. Whatever the reason for the attack, the few surviving Tonk was fled back south of the Red River, saying, we will take our chances down there where they don't like us either. And they settled around Fort Belknap, not far from their old reserve at Clear Fort. And they served for the duration of the war as uh, scouts for Confederate Texas forces. After the war, they continued to serve as scouts for the United States Army and during the Indian Wars. Most of the talk was settled in the vicinity of Fort Griffin, where they continued to serve as scouts until the end of the wars. And then after the Fort Griffin was abandoned in 1881, their presence was no longer welcome. And the surviving talk was in the few associated, now friendly, Lapin Apaches were moved to a reservation in Indian Territory in 1884 in the northern part of the state, away from their Texas Indian enemies. In that year, there were 92 Tonkawas that were counted when they moved to the reservation. They reached the Ponca Agency on June 29th and then finally settled at a place called Oakland on June 30th, 1885. But even then... Not it wasn't long um, that they had their reservation. The Dawes Act caught up with the Comanches, Kiowas, Apaches, Wichita's, Caddo's, and Tonkawas in the 1890s as the Jerome Commission began negotiating the reservation uh, allotment process. Um, October 1891, the commission pressured the Tonkawas to give up their 90,000 acre reservation for $30,600 in individual allotments. 90,000 acres. And then, next thing you know, September 1893, Tonkawa Reservation is thrown open to white settlement. They persevered, though. They still are here. Um, the Tonkawas adopted their own constitution in 1938 and became the Tonkawa Tribe of Indians of Oklahoma. Uh, by 1921, only 34 tribal members remained, according to one estimate I saw. Their numbers have since recovered and are close to 700 or better in the early 21st century. Most live in Oklahoma. Recently, Tonkawa descendants in the central Texas area are, have they been attempting to organize themselves to preserve their heritage and reclaim their tribal rights. And that's the early history of the Tonkawas. And it's one of the things that stood out to me on this one was these were people that came together. Basically, they were the most oppressed of the oppressed that came together, forged an identity, forged a people, a nation, um, actually worked with the Anglo settlers despite being treated badly by them. And, um, and they still persevered uh, through all of their there are many troubles they've encountered over time. Um, I recently realized, uh, mentioned about the Kawas, some of them became part of the Tonkawa tribe. Uh, there is an excellent website that I wish I had discovered before I did my episode on the Karen Kawas. There is a PhD student named Tim 
from Southern Mes- Southern Methodist University who is writing a book on the Karankawas. He has an amazing website, karankawas.com. Go look it up. I, I, there's a note um, in the show notes. There will be a link. There's a link on texashistorylessons.com. You just go to the web's recommended uh, sites page, and it's uh, there. There's a post on the blog on Texas History Lessons about, about the website. And there are car- Kawas here in Texas today trying to organize and mobilize to protect their sacred sites along the Gulf Coast where the Corps of Engineers has got some projects that would destroy known sites where they have existed. I got some good feedback from the Humano Nation. Some interesting stuff. I'm going to share that on the website when I have the time. I'm gonna, they, they sent me some information about some things I might have got a little wrong or just some additional information that I did not realize concerning the name Humano. And I just want to say thank you for listening. Check out the website. I'm constantly trying to make little tweaks and additions here and there on it. Go, if you want a good uh, other podcast to listen to, go check out the Bloody Beaver podcast. Check out the History Sleuth podcast. And if you just want to break from history, go check out the Best of the Rest podcast. I want to thank Ron and Jay for supporting me as patrons on Patreon. Their support has been wonderful. And next episode is going to be a special bonus episode that is going to be dealing with some kind of controversial subjects. I'm not going to lean into the controversy too much. I'm going to talk about historical fact and why why it, it it's important to follow closely what happened in the past. Um, so look for that in the near future. And then we're going to get, uh, eventually to the Caddo nation, which is going to be very exciting and see their ties to, to the, the great Eastern peoples and nations and heritage and cultures that grew up, uh, in the Mississippi area and how that affected us here in Texas. Thanks for listening. I'm Michael and, uh, we'll see you next time. Adios.